Thanks so much, John and Andrew. And uh, that was a great panel. And we have no doubt that the second panel will be just as enriching. Um, just to let you guys know, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and Infectious Diseases, clinician scientist uh, based in Montreal, Canada. And Matt is a good friend of mine who is... Hi, everyone. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center in the U.S. And uh, Nadine and I are both uh, co-vice chairs of INSU Prison. We'll go to the next slide. And we have six incredible panelists. And uh, as we did for the first panel, we'll ask each of our panelists, minus Antons, who's already uh, introduced himself, to introduce himself. So Joaquin, please go ahead. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, my name is Joaquin Cabezas. I'm a gastroenterologist and a hepatologist uh, who I'm working in, in Spain, in Santander, in, a, in, a, in the north of Spain. And I'm in charge of our uh, hepatitis, uh, viral hepatitis management, and also helping the prison that we are referencing in our, in our region. And also involved in, in national plans for, for hepatitis elimination in my region, but also in, in Spain. Thank you, Nadine. Thanks, Joaquin. Good to have you here. Lee, you. Chris, Lee Christensen. Well, yeah, thank you. My name's Lee Christensen. I'm the National Hip Manager for the Hepside Sea Trust based in England. Hip program, so that is essentially a high intensity test and treat program. So we go in to de deliver plan and deliver whole prison testing events right across the country. Been doing that for the Hepatitis C Trust since the start in 2019, and I've worked in the criminal justice system for the last 10 years. It's me, thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, the HIT program has certainly inspired a lot of us around the world, so we look forward to hearing more from you. Karen Hutchinson. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Um, I'm Sharon Hutchinson. Um, I'm an epidemiologist that is based in uh, Glasgow in Scotland. And I've been very much involved in developing uh, the national data uh, monitoring and surveillance um, program in on hepatitis C in Scotland to really inform our public health response. Thank you. Fantastic, Sharon. This is certainly an area that requires a lot more work globally. So we look forward to hearing um, what you've been up to. Lise Lafferty. Thanks. Um, so I am a qualitative social health researcher working in infectious diseases in priority populations um, with a key focus on hepatitis C in prisons. So what that means is that I interview people who are incarcerated, correctional officers, the healthcare workforce and administrators for the prison setting. Thanks, Lise. You're one of the global qualitative experts in uh, prison research, so we're super happy to have you join us. Julia Sheehan. Thank you, Nadine. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Julia Sheehan, and I am National Women's Criminal Justice Manager for the Hepatitis C Trust. Um, so I oversee a um, prison peer program across the 12 female prisons in England. Um, supporting NHS England's elimination program. Thanks so much, Julia. Julia's just joined INSU prisons in the last year, and uh, certainly uh, her work in female prisons um, is going to be enriching for our discussions in the next little bit. So we will move on now. Matt has the first couple of questions, so I will leave it to Matt. Thanks, Nadine. So we've heard the first panel was amazing. It was amazing to hear those experiences from sort of the 30,000 foot view in policy. Um, we're going to be diving more into the models of care. And I wanted to start with um, Lee, if you can tell us about key characteristics of opt-out testing at reception and the HIT model, um, just some of the nitty gritty of, of what makes it work and how you got, got it off the ground in the UK. Lee, you may have to come off mute. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, so some of the characteristics, I think we sort of looked at prisons as an individual. Do you know what I mean? Each establishment by themselves, it's sort of the type of prison and the type of prisons. 
that you were going to. I think for us, it was sort of trying to marry the initial reception and get reception test and ring fenced and then come in alongside and work alongside our partners and key stakeholders in the prisons to de deliver the hit so that we could eliminate in the prison. So part of the hit process is to hold prison test and events to get like test at least 95% of the prison. And again, it comes down to we sort of trying to inform a broad range of staff from the prison side and the healthcare side. We sort of put road shows on to so people could identify what their role was in the bigger picture of elimination and try and gain that motiva motivation for people for it to be inclusive and so we saw the it's amazing stats have come out the amount of people we've done and we've been lucky in that we have a prison peer model right across the english prisons do you know what i mean i can work alongside and provide training to do that so we're total again having dedicated staff working in reception works really well for us in some of the prisons understanding having a good level of awareness around HIV, hepatitis C and hepatitis B, including all to be competent staff. I mean, looking at the different types of testing and did they work in the prisons and changing them from maybe a demand setting to a long-term prison setting where you've got more time and more time with the prisoners. It's gone in the sort there. Of, and then to come in alongside to work with all the partners. And it's really some of the characteristics that work well is having consistent stakeholder engagement from all levels of staff. I mean, sort of communications going from the top to the bottom and then vice versa, including all, so we have a peer programme. We also have a dedicated prisoner peer scheme that works alongside and can do some of the testings in some of the first night centres within the prison. So I mean, dedicated staff. And the peers really work alongside us. I mean, so we have, I'm trying to create, we've also looked at the barriers to test them. So from initial screening to treatment, getting each, because each characteristic can work pro or against, depending on what prison it is and your vitamins it is. So sort of cutting that down, getting each and work alongside each individual prison to identify what their barriers are. Change sometimes it can be as little as a language using different languages with different prisons and involving the peers in it and trying to gain that motiva motivation to reach elimination and keep it. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, no Thank you so much yeah, for that the overview of, of HIP programs. Um, I'm wondering if we can move on to Julia to talk about some of the nitty gritty of peer programs. Uh -huh. I know that's already come up in the previous panel about uh, the role of peer programs for stigma reduction, but um, Julie, if you can follow up on Lee's overview of the HIP program, uh, the role of peers in that in those programs would be great. So um, we have two types of peers um, in the English prisons. We have the paid team of peers, um, which would support the prison pathways and support clinics. Um, and train volunteer peers within the prison. Um, the volunteer peers main role would be delivering awareness training, um, being points of contact for people who need support um, um, and just raising awareness with lots of outreach, any wellbeing events, they would support that. Um, and the paid peers, we also, what well, 80% of us have lived experience of both prison, um, drug using, and um, having had hep C. So um, I think all of us can engage in a different way, in quite um, a non authoritative way, because we're coming in as, you know, a separate entity from the prison. I think that we are quite unique in England in that we actually get access into the prison and um, and get key access as well because it would be really difficult for us to do that and manage I mean we, we have 150 active volunteer peers within the prison and we need to manage them deliver supervision and uh, we need to have access into the prison so yeah 
Um, thank you so much, Julia, for the overview. Can you tell us about some really formative experiences you've had in working with either females or, or patients in general in the UK prison? Yeah, Any stick out? I think people in prison have trust issues. Um, I was one of them. And um, sometimes, you know, coming into prison, you you kind of you you don't have much control over anything but you you do have that choice to say yes or no to a test and you know people do say no so that's kind of where uh myself and and the volunteer peers you know come into play where we can talk to people um we have the time to discuss and allay any fears um you know we we just want to support I think, you know, my job will always be to uh, find people to treat and, and support them to make the decision to accept a course of DAAs and get rid of it. So it's about empowering them to do that. Thanks so much. And moving on to um, the first step of the cascade in terms of testing, um, maybe we can move on to Sharon and Joaquin about experiences you've had with testing. What are some of the models you've used in your settings? Maybe we can start with you, Sharon. Um, sure. What have been successful mod models for testing? Sure. Well, I think I think the key is obviously having approaches that can facilitate um, rapid initiation onto, onto therapy. Um, it's essentially the, the fast tracking of the diagnosis and treatment um, upon entry to prison can, can increase your chances of completing treatment before the release. And that, that's essentially, I think, what, what you, know, you need to um, develop, in, develop your testing treatment pathway to kind of facilitate that. In Scotland, we, we've used dry blood spot testing for well over a decade uh, in a range of settings, including prisons that's um, really helped to facilitate a wider range of staff to undertake this test compared to uh, with phenopuncture. Um, and the use of blood spot testing has been well received, but we can still encounter um, potential delays in the returning results and getting individuals um, uh, treated as quickly as, you, as you'd might wish to do so, so. So certainly, you know, attention is turned uh, to point of care testing, um, and and certainly there's there's probably experience from other countries that that we can draw upon that that demonstrates that you get a high uptake of treatment um, with point of care testing compared to other more uh, standard of care uh, testing assays. Thanks so much. For people who haven't had much experience with these models of testing, can you explain what the process is for dried blood, dried blood spot testing compared to other point of care strategies? Um, I'm, well, I'm not actually as familiar with the point of care testing, perhaps. I don't know if Jacqueline can come in, come in on that one. Sure, yeah. Joaquin, do you want to? Yeah, regarding the, the treatment, first of all, you have to screen or at least test all the patients. And I think the best way to include these patients for treatment is to screen all of them at the early beginning of being admitted in prison in an opt-out uh, manner. And that's the, the best thing you have to, to do to eliminate the bad ADC in prison. And then the way we are working in Spain on our regular practice, this is like a blood run. And usually more than 90% of the hospitals perform the hepatitis C diagnosis with a reflex test. This means that you test first for antibodies, and then if this test is positive, the, the microbiologist uh, automatically perform the RNA. So in, in a single blood test, you have all the, the diagnosis for an active infection. I, and I would like to go further because if you have whole blood with a blood drone also, it's important for these to uh, test for other bloodborne viruses, so you can perform an uh, uh, integrated and uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, diagnosis for these patients for hepatitis B, uh, HIV, syphilis, and maybe uh, tuberculosis, for example. And then regarding the treatment, uh, fortunately, uh, the treatment in prison was included in the beginning of our national plan for hepatitis C treatment. So they were treated regardless of the uh, liver disease fibrosis. At the beginning of the DDA availability, there were some restrictions, but in prison, there was a specific statement where people living in prison could be treated regardless 
regardless of the disease uh, fiber, the, the liver fibrosis. Now there is no restriction at all. And then also Anton raised uh, a nice issue regarding the funding uh, in Spain, the, the prison setting is funded by the Ministry of, uh, of Interior Affairs. And then the, the, the healthcare uh, for specialists depends on the Ministry of Health. So sometimes it's difficult to join both things. Fortunately, I think that having a national plan, a policy developed for hepatitis C globally, not only in prison, but also in the community and join both efforts makes uh, things run smooth to get uh, all people treated at least in, in prison. And regarding the, the dry blood spot, I have also a, a few experiences because in Spain, I don't know, uh, all over the world, we have a, a specific uh, correctional setting, which is called people uh, serving no sentences, uh, norms, or student non -sentence, uh, sentences that are uh, not in prison, but all, also they are in a specific facility that belongs to the correctional setting and they are free, but they have to check in in this facility to serve that sentence. And the, in this place, it makes all the sense to carry out a point of care testing. And also we carry out like a, a, a reflex tests with point of care, a finger stick to, the, to test for antibodies. And those that tested positive, we run a specific variety C gene expert to have the the diagnosis in in an hour time and also the the, the treatment could be delivered in the in the in this setting which it makes all the sense because you have to place close the, the test and also the the treatment in order to engage these people to be to be treated and also in these settings this you have the the global evaluation for hepatitis c and you have to test for all the diseases that the dry blood uh, the dry blood test helps you maybe to rule out uh, hepatitis b or a uh, HIV that this kind of uh, this kind of cartoons with these blood, bright blood spots would help. And thanks. That's, that, that's experience. Thank you, man. Thanks, Joaquin and then Sharon for that really rich information. Anton, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to Joaquin what mentioned about the reflex testing. So, just uh, to say that it's also uh, now has been recommended by WHO for. For laboratory based or clinic based, so if the whole blood is taken, that it can be used for for reflex testing, so testing the same sample. Um, in case of uh, point of care testing, there is an, also another recommendation uh, that point of care testing, both I mean the rapid tests for serology, but there is also point of care confirmation testing uh, for using technologies, for example, like GeneXpert or some others. And it also can increase the linkage to care. And uh, especially, I think in some countries, uh, there are like more developed uh, tuberculosis uh, services, and they usually have those machines, especially if they were procured by the Global Fund. And these machines can be used for, for other infections, including hepatitis C. And uh, there, there are some, um, some examples, uh, some good practices where point of care uh, confirmatory testing is used in harm reduction, but it also can be used in, in prisons and uh, really increase the um, linkage to care and um, put, put people in treatment faster. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anton. So I was actually going to circle back and what can you, you can hand up um, in terms of the financing for gene expert and other point of care RNA testing. Can you comment on what the process was like for that in Spain? Like, was it hard, a heavy lift to get those types of diagnostics into correctional settings? Yes, thank you, Matt. And I think in the in the model of care, we were able to to include the, this uh, point of care testing. It was financed by a, a specific program with, by a grant, uh, having in mind that we could all transfer this model of care to our regular. Um, clinical practice. Unfortunately, the, the COVID pandemic hit this, this program and this gene expert was moved to, to test for COVID, which was most important that time. And at this time, we are this program is, is stopped. And we were able to resume it. But usually the gene expert and also technologies that are for infectious disease comes from our microbiology labs. And unfortunately, I think one third of the hospitals around Spain have them available in the for the community or in their setting, not only in, in prison. So in, I think in prison, the, the availability is, is fewer. Because 
in Spain, most of the prison, they have their medical staff in, within the prison with nurses and uh, physicians. So they are able to perform regular blood uh, drawn and sent to the reference lab to carry out these uh, reflex tests and also the, the, the comprehensive uh, diagnosis of blood bar bonuses. Maybe makes more the sense. Because uh, I, my uh, the prison I'm in charge for for patients are it's like long stay prison so time doesn't matter a lot at the, at the beginning, but I think for those like uh, that are serving non custodial sentences or that are like preemptive or something like that the turnover is higher, the point of care testing should be the 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 recommendation. Absolutely, um, Lee, you had your hand up as well. Did you, did you have a comment? Yeah, that was sort of just again what Joaquin just said around when we do a hitch, we have our own genome you know, expert that comes in with us to do that, to like try and shorten that pathway from point of care testing to treatment. Do you know what I mean? Because again, it's sort of a lot of our like initial demands when you had the high turnover of the prison, you got a chance to lose them. We sort of tend to use the point of care testing and the gene experts to try and shorten the pathway to get them onto treatment as soon as possible. Do you know what I mean? And mainly in the remand settings, because again, we've done some hits a bit like dry blood spot testing, but then it sort of comes down to the labs and how long the turnover is to get your results back from the labs and how many people you can lose that. So again, it comes down to the individual prisons and trying to create the shortest pathway from test to treatment. Absolutely, and especially in remand settings. Um, there's a, a, um, a shout out for peer interventions from Derek in the chat. Um, so keep an eye out there and please feel free to put questions in the Q&A and I'll hand it over to Nadine to ask some questions. Thanks, Matt. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to address Derek's uh, shout out a little bit more. And that was, I was really interested with Julia's comment about um, the fact that there are paid peers and there are voluntary peers and whether that's at all controversial to not pay peers despite their contributions um, in prison. So, you know, the current recommendation for WHO is that they that all peers should be compensated. And so curious to know if there's a movement towards um, paying those voluntary peers in the near future. It's a great question. Nadine. Um, I mean, I would love our peers to be paid. And there is a proportion that are, but they would be um, wearing like a hep C peer hat and be a, a peer for may maybe a healthcare peer or a substance misuse peer. So we would train them to wear a hep C peer hat as well. So they would get paid. Um, peers that take part in HITS um, get a bonus. Um, we give Christmas bonus, um, but I just, I, I would love them to be paid. I just don't think that we have a pot of cash to do that. I would love that. I think we all would. And as someone who's uh, starting a study in integrating peers, and I've never done this before, I actually went to my Australian colleagues who have uh, utilized peers just to get a sense of how much they should be paid. This is slightly divergent to our conversation, but certainly the range was anywhere between 24 and uh, sorry, 25 and $45 an hour. So the compensation is relatively uh, equivalent to, you know, someone with, uh, you know, adequate level of, of education and training. So something to consider for all of us who are considering integrating peers in any of our models of cares and uh, studies going forward. I'll start off. Uh, my first question is going to be directed to uh, Lise. Um, Lise, what type of training do you think is useful or helpful for prison healthcare staff to implement hepatitis C programs? I know Lee touched or um, Luke touched upon addressing fear and stigma, but I'm curious to hear what else you have to say on the matter. I, I definitely agree with Luke about addressing fear and stigma through education, um, but I think it needs to be a whole of prison approach, so not just one particular group. Um, one of the things that was touched on in the report <clears throat> by Chris Byrne and, and Tony McClure was the runners um, and in New South Wales, that would be the correctional officers. 
who go and retrieve patients to bring them to the clinic. And that's that's a key point there. And that's that's a where a lot of people in prison might say no because of that engagement experience. And we saw within the Stop C study um, that when officers went and retrieved people, you know, they might use derogatory terms or there's a real sense of shame and judgment that's happening there during that intervention. But correctional officers who were champions and understood the hepatitis C benefits, the treatment benefits for hep C for the whole of prison, not just people in prison, they were much more um, inviting and welcoming and, and keen to bring people forward to the clinic and didn't see it as you know, an additional burden to their workload that they were having to do and, and a begrudged experience, but, but contributing to the community and not to use community in prison. That doesn't seem to align very well, but to benefit everyone. That's great, Lise. And Lee, I know that you mentioned as well that there were several stakeholders involved uh, before the HIT uh, program became as successful as it has. I'm curious, was there any uh, direct training that um, the individuals um, undertook prior to uh, formally um, becoming part of the program? Yeah, so we tend to be deliver hepatitis awareness training to healthcare staff, prison officers, prison peers. Do you know what I mean? We OMU as many staff as we can. We sort of to get that so because I think it's having that consistent approach. When we're in there and we're delivering a hit, you know what I mean? So if anyone's asked any questions, we have a frequently asked questions list. So everyone's given the same consistent message. You're not confusing any more issues. Do you know what I mean? And then, and again, the big part of that is our prison peers based on the landings. You know what I mean? So they be trained up weeks in advance and we train them how to deliver their life story to peers. And you can incorporate five key questions within that around like treatments available to everyone. Certain other aspects to that to like make sure that like everyone's getting that that, that same approach because I think the more staff and we've had that way we sort of when we're doing a hit we look for dedicated support staff for that time of doing it and you can see the more knowledge that they're picking up and we come with that approach that like we're not just doing this for prisoners you know what I mean we're trying to keep everyone safe and that's all the staff in in the prison environment too. Yeah, that's perfect, um, Lee. I think the, the message there is really consistent messaging and making sure that everyone as part of the program delivers the same key message. Um, that's fantastic. My next question, we talk a lot about decentralized care, but I'm curious, Joaquin and Anton's, Joaquin particularly as a specialist, do you think there's a role? Do you still think there's a role for specialists in prison or can task shifting accomplish all the tasks that a specialist can um, undertake in prisons? Thank you, Nadine, for the question. I must say that um, in Spain, uh, the, the DDA treatment for hepatitis C is uh, it's a high impact drug, so it must be prescribed and delivered from the hospital. That's because of the law, so I cannot do anything in this regard. But I think uh, we have tons of experience. They are uh, easy drugs to manage patients, at least patients that has uh, non-complicated liver disease. And there are uh, specific experiences that a nurse-led uh, prescription and management or pharmacists or GPs like Echo Project in the US can deliver these, these treatments that are easy to manage for, for, for patients. So I think uh, I, I'm completely sure. I still prescribe treatment for people living in prison because it is mandatory in Spain that the communication and the, the lead in, in treatment management should be done by the people that are visiting the patients face to face because it's, it's at least for those, uh, because I'm a specialist for those that has uh, that have a, a non-complicated liver disease are, that are not decompensated or they do, are not presented with an advanced liver disease or maybe a infection that makes sense to be visited by infectious disease or something like that. But most of the patients that are we visit and we increase the treatment will be easy to treat patients. But Great, treatment you. must be done, sure, and the screening because at least in Spain, one in four patients usually present with an advanced disease, unfortunately. Mm. So it's much to do. 
Thanks. So it sounds like apart from advanced cirrhosis, there's probably very little indication to having specialists in prison. Antons, do you agree? Yeah, fu yeah, fully agree actually with Joaquin. I think uh, um, as more, if you test more, so if you test more people, then the, there will be a bigger proportion of uh, patients with uncomplicated hepatitis C. Uh, which can be easily treated uh, by 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 non specialists, and uh, there's also one of the new recommendations in this uh, new guidelines that uh, the task shifting um, it's the, and there is evidence that increases the access uh, to treatment and, uh, and and completion of treatment if it's uh, if the treatment is provided by uh, non specialist clinicians, but also even by by trained nurses. But I think, of course, there is still a role of uh, specialists uh, because, as you mentioned, I mean, there are patients with cirrhosis or co-infection or with other uh, problems. But I think in 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 the prison settings, it's it probably it's not uh, very cost effective uh, to have a specialist all the time. But there there are different yeah. models that they can be visiting once a month, or there is also telemedicine options like the Echo platform, exactly. uh, which is uh, used in uh, many countries where they. Um, the, the, the treating attending physician can consult with the uh, with the specialist. So yeah, I think that the, the different uh, different approaches again. Over. Fantastic. Let's move on to um, a topic that re receives very little attention and even less research, and that is linkage to care. Um, we know that. Over 50% of the incarcerated population serves very short sentences and are released before initiation of treatment or even completion. I'm curious, um, Julia, to hear what your experience is in linking patients to care and if there's any models that uh, the rest of the world can think to adopt that uh, have had some success. We have um, a Follow Me program which started in the community and we kind of nicked it for the prison setting because what we um, came to see was that people were coming in for really short periods of time, getting released and there was no real continuity of care. Um, so what the follow me is, is we get consent from the patient to follow them on release and support them on release. Consent to liaise with probation services, um, where they pick up their OST and o OATs. Um, uh, if they don't have an address, it might be where they beg, or um, if they sleep in a tent somewhere, we'll, we'll get where that is. And um, yeah, and, and we will follow them into the community. And I think I have I've got some stats here. So, um, so far, since we started the Follow Me program, we've supported over a thousand prisoners into the community and vice versa, back into prison again, for those that come in for really short periods of time and are out for really short periods of time. And we've supported 600 treatment starts so for me, that's just incredible. And I think um, as we edge closer to elimination, um, we're people that are, are engaged in services and, and are quite engaging have been treated. And now um, the people that are left are, are, um, require more time, more support, um, and that's where we're really coming into our own through the gate work, where our community team comes and meets that patient before they get released. So they've like got a face to who's going to support them. They can be picked up at the gate. Um, and, and yeah, it is for us to support them through their treatment, but it's so much more than that as well. And, you know, lots of our prisoners get released with nowhere to go. So we can support them with that. Um, if they fall off their, their um, OAT prescription, we can support them to get back onto it. And, and the communication is key between community and prison. So um, if, if someone 
for instance, may get released from prison and, and their medication doesn't go with them, which sometimes happens, they might be released from court, we can get that medication to them. And then vice versa, if they're in the community and they get recalled to prison and they turn up without their medication, we can get our community team to get it and drop it off. So yeah, it really is an incredible piece of work and ever more important as we near our elimination. Well, that's fantastic, Julia. I would love to see uh, some co cost effectiveness studies come out of your work because these are resource intensive programs um, that you know clearly have worked in your model, but um, to convince policymakers that they are worth the effort um, certainly, that's an area that still requires some additional uh, research. Um, a couple of final questions. Uh, the next one will be on surveillance. Uh, Sharon, this one is for you. We've done a probably, I, I think we all agree globally, a poor job of, uh, of um, monitoring uh, hepatitis C prevalence uh, in prisons, focusing on the antibody, not RNA, focusing on prevalence rather than incidence very little uh, work on reinfection. And so I'm curious if any of us want to start a, a surveillance for, program, um, how do we get started? And what do you think the role is um, of surve surveillance for reinfection and transmission in prisons? Okay, so I, th I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head then. I, th I think is what Andrew presented earlier that we go pretty, scant data on um, progress on hep C elimination within prison settings, even in a European context, let alone um, a globally. Um, so I think, you know, to really get us started on trying to improve our surveillance in um, prison settings, then we've got to kind of highlight the priority of this um, and, and potentially even that, you know, maybe this comes not just at a national level, but a, but a global level in really recognising the importance of us um, monitoring um, hep C infection within the prison settings. Uh, we've got these global targets, um, which are now being adapted to focus on certain key uh, risk groups, such as people who inject drugs, so it does beg the question where at, a, at that global level, whether we need, we need to have, um, I guess, greater focus on that, because I think it's really um, that will help support national local efforts to, um, you know, a, a get, get some a coordinated effort on that and get some uh, increased funding to, to support um, uh, all of that. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the work that's happened in settings like in Spain and in, in England, where you've got actually very good coverage of testing um, on admission to prison, um, that really does act almost like a surveillance initiative. We can actually generate really good data if we get very high uptake of um, testing um, at that point of entry and obviously um, can, and can need to follow through and look at the, the, the kind of diagnosis of an uptake of um, a, a, a treatment in those settings as well. And through that, you get a very good understanding of levels of infection in the prison setting, but also you get an understanding of what progress has been made out with uh, prison settings in the community as well. You can kind of see, um, you know, the, the impact of the, the scale up across all settings through even just monitoring within prison. And I think we need to tease that out more. Reinfection, I think you've touched upon, um, and that's certainly something that we've kind of been uh, kind of monitoring closely um, within Scotland. Again, utilising a lot of our administrative data, so we're kind of linking up records from, you know, all settings to understand um, uh, uptake of testing following um, um, a, a successful treatment in a range of settings, and then looking at the extent of uh, reinfection. And what you do find is people that are treated within prison settings do have a higher risk of uh, reinfection. And I think it hits home that we really do need to um, promote um, a testing uh, in, in uh, amongst those being treated in prisons 
uh, and, and other um, uh, uh, risk groups as well. Um, but that will involve not just testing, routine testing in prisons, but it also involves uh, scaled up testing in the community, which, you know, because people will get released into the community and therefore we need to follow up people in the community as well, not just in prison. Thanks so much, Sharon, and, and to everyone. I just, we are one minute over and I wanted to just ask uh, Lise to get the, to uh, give us the final words. There was a comment earlier about the opportunity of hepatitis C screening and treatment in prisons. And, and Lise, um, I'm gonna allow you to have the final words before we ask our, our uh, attendees to complete their evaluation. Thanks, Nadine. Um, I think the question was around that was raised was around calling it the opportune time for testing. And I think that's that's a big issue of language that we often throw around in public health discourse around hepatitis C treatment, testing and treatment in prisons. And what we know is that people who are engaged and cycle in and out of prison, that often they they can prefer engagement, healthcare engagement, whilst incarcerated than in the community. This can be due to a myriad of reasons, such as competing priorities in the community. You know, if they get released, they often have a whole range of, of things that they're trying to navigate through. Hep C certainly doesn't rank up there, as a lot of other healthcare needs don't get prioritized very often beyond perhaps opioid therapies. And then, um, in prison, there's often the, the one-stop shop model of the clinic, and which makes it heaps easier for people to access healthcare whilst incarcerated than in the community if they're out on parole and adhering to a number of, of different expectations from the parole officer to be able to just go into prison. Once in prison, to be able to go forward to just go to the one GP, the one pathology, and not have to go buses across town, it's, it can be easier for people. Thanks. Thanks, Lise. I'm going to pass it over back to John and Andrew to complete uh, the session. Thank you, Nadine. Thanks to everyone for a, a really robust discussion that we touched on a lot of uh, uh, a lot of points. 